What's going on everybody? My name is Ian and welcome to another IR Skills video. Today I'm going to go over the basics of dynamic cloths in ZBrush and how you'll be able to use it in your projects. Okay everybody, so today we're going to be covering the basics of dynamics within ZBrush. And if you're unfamiliar with what the dynamics feature is, it is essentially a simulation feature that allows you to manipulate and deform your sub tools to get the feel of cloth or crunching. So that's what we're going to be covering today. So right here, I have a few examples that we're going to be covering, and we're just going to be using the plane 3D to kind of demonstrate exactly how it works. And we're going to be using it against a sphere and a cylinder just so you can get the basic idea. If you guys like this type of video and you would like to see a more advanced tutorial on how to use it, especially creating uh, clothing within ZBrush, comment in the comment section down below, and I'll definitely make that video. So let's go ahead and let's get into it. So the first example that we have in front of us today is actually going to be the cylinder and uh, the plane 3D. And what is important to remember when you're using dynamic simulation is the amount of geometry you have for the subtool you want to deform will greatly depend on the effect that you have. As you can see here, if we come up to the top and we hit shift M to get the magnifying glass up, we have a active point total of 289 for my plane 3D. This isn't a whole lot, but it is enough to get started. Uh, if we crunch this up, and I have another one right here, to let's say about a thousand, then we'll actually end up getting a better deformation because there's more geometry to actually uh, remember and actually uh, utilize to conform around the bottle. And I'll, I'll show you the example right now. So to set this up, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna open up this left menu and we're going to come over and pop this on over here by dragging this little icon and drag and dropping it here. And now we have a few features that might be a little confusing. I'm just going to cover the features that you're going to need to know to get started. So we're going to ignore a good chunk of this. But the things that we want to remember are gravity, which is always selected and turned on. And we want to make sure that this gravity is actually low. It's set standard to 10, and that is really fast. If I run this right now, it's just going to fall to the ground. So that's really, really fast. We're going to want to end up slowing that down, but I'll do that in a second. The other thing we're going to do is come on down here to this lower panel, and we have a couple buttons we want to remember. Collision volume, recalculate, which is grayed out right now, and inflate. Now, inflate will actually keep a certain space between the subtool that you're deforming and the subtools that it will collide with. I tend to turn this down to zero, so we're going to go ahead and do that. I don't usually like to have a whole lot of space in between my models. What we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and take this gravity and we're going to set this down to about, let's go, let's go 0.5. Start pretty low. And we're gonna come down here to recalculate and we're gonna hit that. Every time you make an adjustment to the dynamics uh, or to the viewport, you're gonna wanna recalculate your dynamics because what will happen is when you, when you recalculate for dynamics, it actually remembers everything it sees within the viewport. So right now it remembers that there is a cylinder here. If I were to go ahead and run this, it's gonna go ahead and start moving around that cylinder. Now, let's say I don't want the cylinder there anymore. So I'll hit Control-Z to back that up. If I just hide the cylinder and I don't hit Recalculate and I hit Run Simulation, it's actually going to remember that the cylinder was there. And while that's kind of a cool effect, that's not what we want. So we're going to want to make sure that we hit Recalculate and then it will actually come up with an error saying collision can only be calculated for non active visible subtools, meaning it needs another subtool there. So we're gonna go ahead and turn that back on. So I know that was a lot to take in and Dynamics has a lot of functions and stuff within it that it can get confusing really quickly. So just to recap, anytime you make a change within the Dynamics menu or you change something in the viewport or something in the subtool palette where you end up maybe moving a subtool a little bit or make or hiding one. Anytime you make a change, just get used to hitting the recalculate button because that's going to ensure that the changes you make are officially set. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go over um, the reasons why you would actually want to take up your uh, or boost up your subdivision a little bit and uh, some recommended numbers on what to avoid. What I would like to cover is that a lot of this is CPU dependent and 
for me, that's super important because I used to have a machine that didn't have a strong CPU when I first uh, got this feature uh, or started playing with this feature. And the thing that I realized was that um, it really bogged things down when I had this number up really, really high. So that's where dynamic subdivision is going to come in to help us. So just a little disclaimer, if you're starting to see that your, your machine is really bogging down, it, it might be best to go ahead and check your subdivision level and try to keep that down as much as possible. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to come up to this example here where I have a plain 3D that I just brought in and it's defaulted at just a little over a thousand active points. And so if we come back to our first one real quick, we'll see here the 289 points. We just recalculate the scene and we're going to go ahead and hit run simulation and we're going to leave this alone once it deforms a bit. But you can see here some of the problems that we already notice is well, a, it's a single-sided geometry, so it's only going to recognize certain points. And it's trying its best to deform around the cylinder. However, the points itself, there are um, connections that aren't being made within those points. And so it kind of just breaks through. Um, that's because of the geometry. So if we're going to just go ahead and hide this one for a second, go up to this one, and recalculate the scene now, we're going to notice that this one will deform a lot better because there is more active points within it. So let's go ahead and hit run. And we'll see right now that it's actually going to do a much better job deforming around that cylinder. And if we just stop that and turn off the, uh, the cylinder and we just look at the differences. Yeah, turn off the cylinder. Now let's just look at the differences between this cloth, which you can see has a lot more wrinkles in it versus this one, which only has a few. And even if we hit D to bring up dynamic subdivision and say yes, you can see that although it looks pretty cool and it's smooth, if we come up to this one and hit D as well, you can see that we're actually getting a much better, cleaner result. And let's actually change the material so that we could see it a lot better. So you can see here the results between the two are night and day difference, and that's only uh, a matter of geometry that it has within the subtool. Now that we've gone over the basics of how to get started and also what the different type of geometry levels and results that you would get between something that's a little bit low level and something that has a little bit more resolution, now I want to get into how we can use dynamic subdivision to our benefit. What we can do, let's back this one up in particular here, and we're going to go down to geometry and we're going to go to dynamic subdivision. Now, if you're familiar with dynamic subdivision or what dynamic subdivision is, if you hit D on the keyboard, it will prompt a question saying if you want to use dynamic subdivision for the first time, you'd say yes. And then you're actually presented with some options under dynamic subdivision. And you can use all these within dynamic cloth to get the results that you want. So in this example, let's say we're making a tabletop cloth and we have our cylinder. So let's put our cylinder back. And we're just making sure that we want the cloth to wrap around, but we need a certain thickness. What you could do is come to geometry, and then you can actually set up your thickness as such by dragging this number out. And if we turn off dynamic and turn it back on, you can see that the thickness is not actually set. It's not applied yet. It's just, again, simulating that. And we could still use this to see what the effects we can get. So we'll go ahead and we'll keep that on. We have the thickness of about 0 0.01, 0 0.02, and then we'll go ahead and hit recalculate. And now we can go ahead and hit run simulation, and we can watch this deform around the cylinder and what kind of result we'll be getting. Once we get the result that we are looking for, we can actually come over here and hit apply. And if we just solo this out, we now have set geometry that is uh, formed the way we would like. And here's the thing to remember, before we applied it, so I'm going to hit control Z, if we come up to the top, this active point, like I said, is a thousand or just a little bit over because it's still recognizing it as dynamic subdivision, single sided surface. Because again, if we turn this off, it's single sided, turn this back on, and now that thickness is applied. Here's why you don't want to use such high subdivision. If we were to go ahead and back this up, and we're gonna hit apply. We're now working at 33,000. And that's a lot of points for any computer to really uh, to really operate on. 
So if we go ahead and have that cylinder here and we hit recalculate, when, when we hit run simulation, it's actually gonna really slow down. And this is not sped or this is not slow down anyway. This is real time. It's really dragging on the computer. And this is kind of a good example to show you that the higher the number, the more information that ZBrush actually has to calculate. And while you might get a really nice result, it's almost a waste of time and waste of your machine's resource. And as you can see here, I, I'm still talking and it is still taking its sweet, sweet time. And again, the higher that number, the more intense it's gonna be on your machine. So just really be careful about that. All right, so the last thing I wanna cover is the transpose cloth brush. Now, this is a really cool brush because a lot of times when you're working with dynamics, if you just wanna run a simulation and stuff like that, um, you can get some pretty quick results, but let's say you want something a little bit more custom. Let's say you actually want to kind of wrap something around or twist something. This is where the transpose cloth brush comes in. So we have a, a uh, sphere and then we have our plain 3d and it's just a basic plain 3d at a little over a thousand points and i have dynamic turned on and what we're going to do is we're going to come into the brush and we're going to hit transpose cloth and what's really cool about this is if we hit recalculate on the dynamics we now can move our with our transpose cloth and you can see here it's starting to wrap around this and then you can come over and you can actually start pulling or rotating and getting more shapes. It also recognizes the floor. If we turn the floor on, we can see that there's a floor here. That's where up here in the dynamics menu, we have floor collision turned on. If we turn that off and recalculate, then it'll actually ignore the floor altogether. And we can go ahead and just manipulate this shape a lot. And this is really cool because again, you can sit here and just kind of make custom shapes based on the objects you wanted to form. And then if we turn this around, we can start to see the makings of a little ghost. So another really cool feature with dynamics that is really fun and simple to use. Okay, everybody, that's it for today's video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to be aware of more videos like this. If you guys have any questions about cloth dynamics, please tell me in the comment section down below because I know it's a lot of information and I'll happily try to answer your questions the best I can. And I have a few other advanced tutorials coming up soon, but if you are more eager to get those out quickly, please let me know and I'll go ahead and get those recorded as soon as possible. Again, guys, thank you so much. And and as always, I'll talk to you later. Bye.